All right, so no concerns. By your silence, I uh, take that as consent. I say that I say that slightly with jest, based on today's topic about privacy. Uh, so for privacy, let's get started by looking at the contrast between these concepts, privacy, anonymity, and security. Now we have a whole session planned for security. That's going to be kind of like a different type of security than this. This is security here is just a broad general term for sort of avoiding risk or you know keeping what keeping something safe that you need to apply some security to. I think next week we're going to talk about security in terms of like blockchain attacks and specific threats to blockchain systems in that sense. Uh, so today's topic is privacy. That's the first one on the list. And it's closely tied to anonymity. And so we're going to try to untangle this web between these three. And so I'm going to write on the board. OK, so three nice big bubbles. Try to get some overlap between all three. So privacy, security, and anonymity. So some of these things are going to be on like a sliding scale. There's not an absolute version of one over the other. And so my Venn here should capture some of these relationships. So I guess, first of all, let's do some short definitions of what we mean. OK, so privacy. This is kind of like the key concept here. But we're going to say that privacy is someone's choice to keep information to themselves. So when we say that you want something to be private, usually people then have the choice to reveal that information. Uh, and so classic examples are like friends and family or like your boyfriend, girlfriend, right? They usually get the broad set. So they get to know everything. But then the further away in your social circle you go, people are exposed to less and less of what you would call that private or personal information. Uh, so we'll just say here, choice. To reveal, uh, in data, PII comes up. So I'll write it down there. I'm not sure if it's necessarily relevant. That's personally identifiable information in term, from like a data science perspective. But you get the choice to reveal your info. So we'll, we'll say that that's acting in a private manner. Coming around, acting in an anonymous manner. The anon here. We want to be able to have our actions uh, sort of shielded from our identity. So we want to be able to separate these two things. So we're going to say that the anonymous person cannot be individually identified. So your actions are visible. And our first example of the anonymous person is going to be like a protester. So your actions are visible, but you yourself are not identifiable. So that's being anonymous. Uh, and then the last one, security. This is kind of just fairly plain, fairly vanilla. So we're going to say that security is just absence of risk or free from risk, keeping something safe. Keep it safe. OK, so let's get into some examples then. Are, are, are we all right with this? Three ideas, three branches, and how we're defining them. Uh, if you're keen on this topic, you're going to, of course, find all of these sort of gray areas and areas where you want to be very specific about what you mean in each, in each case or in each example. OK, I mentioned our anonymous example. So being anonymous, this is like blending in in the crowd. And so an example here where you might want to stay anonymous is a protester. So everybody comes together to participate in the protest, right? But you don't want the CCTV using you know, uh, state database knowledge to identify you by some machine learning uh, technique. Uh, and, you know, so you wear a hat, 
and a hoodie, that, that sort of thing. Or you wear a mask to try to keep yourself anonymous in the crowd. Um, and so protester, this one we need crowds. If you go organize and execute a protest, but it's just you, okay, then your anonymity decreases drastically. Similarly, if you want to transact in a financial system and it's just you doing the transactions, even if you sort of have the best tech available, but there's nobody else to blend in with, uh, then the anonymity goes away. So anonymity can come and go based on your context. So who's participating with you? So protester crowds, it doesn't have to be a protest, right? If you like are riding a busy public transit, you're on the bus, uh, nobody is individually identifiable, but collectively we can all see everybody and we know we know who's there, and if you keep track of an individual, you can see like where they get on and where they get off. Uh, okay, let's do privacy next. So an example of something being private, well, this is just like uh, our own personal, personal documents. So, you know, that documents folder on your laptop, on your phone, all those, all those screenshots that you have, right, that you assume are never going to, you know, see the light of day. Um, it, you probably assume that it doesn't matter, you know, which is, which is fine until it does matter and somebody decides to you know, have access to all of the information on your phone. So things that are private, these are like documents folder, uh, or in the analog world, right, this is like a diary, a journal. So you're the one that writes it, it's only meant for you. But if someone else were to read it, they'd be able to identify you, so you're not anonymous, right? And if you want it to be secure, you have to do something else. You have to add security into it. It's not by nature secure. Now, maybe your documents folder is encrypted, but that's, again, a layer on top to provide that security. So that would be a private privacy example. Okay, so perfect analog example of security is the bank vault. So you trust the bank to only let you in. The bank knows that it's you, so you're not anonymous. And the bank knows what you're doing, what's in the vault. Okay, so it's not private either, uh, but it is secure. And, you know, banks are very good at security. In fact, that's sort of their, uh, their primary business model that got them going. Nowadays, the primary business model is more like, uh, uh, more like trading and extracting fees from customers, but the banks are very good at security. So bank vault, uh, and in a digital sense, security is gonna come from encryption. So something like that, where we have very good encryption that's been around a long time and we can trust it. Uh, and then we can blend these elements together. So if we blend together something that's private and something that's anonymous in this bubble here, I'm thinking of like a digital type of example. Um, this would be like a, an anonymous testimony, okay? So the person reading the statement doesn't know who did it, all right? And you are assured that only certain people have access to it, but so testimony in like a court system. In the digital world, we're thinking of something like Pastebin, which is create an account on Pastebin, and you can like paste up snippets of code essentially into, into Pastebin. Um, but you have the option of making them private. So Pastebin or something where you have the choice to make it private, it's like an unlisted video on YouTube. So paste bin or unlisted. So say you make a video and put it on YouTube uh, and you want to show your client, you want to show your employer, your friend what you did, all right, you can unlist it and then just send them the link. So nobody can find it, it won't appear in any, any listings, all right. So in that sense, 
it's not public. It's only private between whoever you want it to be. Pastebin is the same, same type of way, an unlisted uh, directory. And you can send that link around um, as a way to combine these two together. If we want to remain anonymous in the digital sense, but also be secure, most of the security is going to come from encryption. So the example here is Tor. You all know what Tor is? T-O-R, yeah, a couple of people nodding. OK, so the Onion router, T-O-R. Um, if you have Brave installed, maybe other browsers as well, and you do like a private browsing tab, you have the option to do your searches or your web browsing through Tor. And it's a little bit slower than the normal web. And what's happening there is your traffic is just getting routed between different Onion routers. Uh, and that is breaking the link in terms of um, source and destination. So it's breaking that up. So Tor is going to give you security through encryption, and it's going to give you anonymity through the routing process. Um, now Tor, just like being in the crowd, Tor only works if there's other routers that are participating. If there's only one single router, then you know all the traffic is going into that one router and is also coming out of that router. But if you have a lot of different people participating, then you can't, after a certain number of hops, you're not going to be able to tell uh, where that traffic came from. Now Tor is not entirely private because if you sit at the exit point, you can still see what people are doing on Tor, but you don't know who is doing it. So you can see that people are going to some marketplace. You know, you can see that uh, people uh, are going to whatever website, all right? But you don't know who it is. They are still anonymous. So Tor fits there sort of between these two. Um, next, next up, we want something that's secure and private. So this is pretty common. Uh, I think all of us probably have an email address. Definitely, we have an institutional email address. And if it's encrypted, OK, then that provides the security. So Signal and WhatsApp, uh, you know, their business model, they're, they're known to have end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, and so that gives you the security. And it's also private, right? Because only you and the recipient of that message can read it. So that's where the privacy comes in. Uh, it's not anonymous, though, because those messages, right? Uh, I do, you're, you're interacting with someone you know, and so they can be identified if you read the messages. But between these two, so we could also put like uh, email in here. But uh, be a little bit careful. Uh, not basic email. It has to be uh, encrypted email in order to keep security here. So Signal, WhatsApp uh, as private and secure, but not anonymous. Uh, and I guess you see this from time to time in in the media in cases where these chats get published. So the idea was that they were private, uh, and then something happens, uh, and some person or some court compels somebody to either release or leak the chats. OK, so we got one big bubble in the middle here, right? This is the one that we would like to fill in. So we want security, privacy, and anonymity. Anyone know what I'm going to put in here? You got an idea? Uh, uh, I'll take a guess. Bitcoin. Bitcoin? OK, you'll take a guess. Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is not private, right? All of the information is published on the blockchain. So you're right. We need to put Bitcoin on the board. We do not go a day here without talking about Bitcoin. Where did I put my red pen? Uh, so Bitcoin is secure. So I'll put Bitcoin here, and we'll fill in this a little bit more in a second. Bitcoin is secure through the public-private key pair. And Bitcoin is kind of anonymous, but if you use it a lot or if you look really closely, you can perhaps infer activity. Um, Bitcoin is not private because the amounts and the addresses are published, and anyone can go see them. So in the middle, 
Any other thoughts? What do we want to put in the middle? Uh, so I've, I've got two, and we can. debate if we think they're appropriate. Uh, so the first up, the digital version, I'll say is WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks is set up as a repository where people can dump documents. Uh, uh, another idea is like any type of platform that is good for whistleblowing, right? Whistleblowing is this thing where you are an internal member of an organization, and you see some documents or data that's you know violating some sort of principle, uh, and you might want to leak it to someone and protect your own identity. So WikiLeaks allows you to be anonymous when you submit. They've got some basic web encryption for security. And then the privacy part of WikiLeaks is that when you enter into, you know, when you agree to drop a document into WikiLeaks, you're under the assumption that it's only going to the editor. So the editors are the only people that are going to read it. And then that disassociates the link from you. If the editors choose to publish further, uh, you know, that's sort of their prerogative. Um, and there's like debates about this, whether WikiLeaks should be public and anyone, or uh, you can just go browse. And I think you can just go browse through a lot of what WikiLeaks has. Um, the analog equivalent here, if you are involved in a lot of spy work or uh, uh, exchanging money for illegal goods and services, maybe. Uh, something like a dead drop, all right, where uh, some, there's a location. You don't know who drops off the money or the documents at the location, but you can then go pick them up afterwards, and they're there. So that's like the analog version of the WikiLeaks, right? You don't know who dropped that document into the folder, but the editor can go in and read and decide what to do with it afterwards um, as a way to give us a, a little bit of all of these three characteristics. OK, so we better overlay this with our cryptocurrency knowledge. So we'll start with Bitcoin. So here we go. Bitcoin, like I said, secure public-private key pair. You know, the network has never, nobody's managed to double spend uh, any Bitcoin. Uh, the process of mining in concert with public-private key pairs has managed to do pretty well so far. And it looks like you know, the longer Bitcoin survives, it looks like it's going to survive into the future even longer. But when you transact on Bitcoin, Ethereum is the same. Okay, When you transact, the amount that you're transacting, the address you're sending to and collecting from, these are all public. So straight away, we violate privacy. All this stuff is public, and it's published. And in Bitcoin and Ethereum, you don't have the option, like I mentioned, with Pastebin to make it private. Okay, So the idea with Bitcoin is that everybody verifies all the transactions. And in order for that to work, I have to be able to know all the transactions. So you know, by design, I have to know to, from, and the amount. So we got secure. We got. We're going to call this pseudo-anonymous. So that's a good word, pseudo. That's a tough word to spell, pseudo-anonymous. Um, because what you could do, perhaps, is link activity and then map it back to a person in, in the real world, um, especially considering that all the history, so not just like what's happening now, but all the history back to the beginning of the blockchain is public. So there's this, uh, there's, there's this idea now that crimes you commit in the future, right? or even if they're not crimes today, what if you do something in the future? Uh, what if you do something today that is criminal in the future? Retroactively, you can go back and look at the transaction history. So pseudonymity, all right, uh, important to recognize the distinction here. So pseudonymous. Um, now there's some things we can do about this. So I'm going to draw an arrow like this. If we add anonymity to a cryptocurrency, then we get into this bubble here. And so if we add anonymity, this is through 
This is through transaction pools or privacy pools. We can add anonymity. So just like hiding in the crowd, if we put our transaction data into a pool of other data, then we can obfuscate exactly uh, who it is. So you know that there was a transaction, maybe you know a time frame, but you don't necessarily know exactly where it came from uh, or who it's going to. And so that can, that can help. If we add pools in here, then we get sort of to this spot in here. And we'll talk a little bit about pools today. Uh, and that's kind of where we are now. I want to put a few more bits in here in terms of money. So if you're anonymous and you're private, this is the case of cash. So cash is still pretty anonymous and fairly private, uh, at least as far as our sort of uh, Venn diagram is going here. Cash is not secure though, right? Because you have to you have to fight off attackers, right? You have to add security. You have to put it in the mattress, put it in the vault. So cash doesn't come with its own security, but it's private and anonymous. If you get a, a stack of bills, you don't know where they've been in the past. So crypto, we got cash, and around this way, something that's secure and private. Well, this one is really digital finance, or maybe I should even just put banking there. It doesn't have to be finance. Right, banking on your app. Very secure, very rare that you have money stolen from a bank account, that type of thing. Um, it's also private, okay? I can't find out what your bank account is doing. Your, you can't find out what mine is doing. All right, so there's some editorial process in there. So there's some privacy between us and the bank. But it's not anonymous, all right? And so our name is attached to all of that activity. And that's you know, the trade-off that we make, likely just for the idea of security, which banks are, are very good at. Uh, they're very good at trust and uh, trust in the security of, of your money. Where they fall apart is maybe for some of the other parts that are on the on the board here. I'll put another one up. CBDCs, so central bank digital currencies, which are, we're just sort of on the horizon of CBDCs coming in to play pretty much globally. Almost everyone has a pilot project or a prototype in the works for central bank digital currencies. And we might talk about more of the, talk more about this in our lecture on digital assets. But CBDCs, you know, we're thinking secure from the bank and uh, private, but not private from authorities or from the bankers, just private from each other. So that's one of our shades of privacy, one of our levels of privacy. All right, so most cryptocurrency, we're lingering between pseudonymity and maybe we can add some tools to get to anonymity. And if we do that, we might even if we can eliminate all these fields and we don't know where it's going, who it's going to, where it came from, how much it is, then we might also get into, I guess, the middle here, into the privacy piece as well. I uh, saw this on the weekend. This is very recent. Uh, Eric Fouries gave the keynote speech at Permissionless uh, Conference. Like national interest. Today, across all the taxes that you bear, half of your money is stolen by the state. Okay. All right, so pretty easy to uh, listen there to Eric. I mean, he said some great things, right? Like, all activity that we do, you know, today, now, requires money, right? All, all of it. There, you know, there are a certain number of people that do not have access to banking services, or that are maybe not involved in modern uh, internet infrastructure. All right, uh, but I think generally we recognize that those people probably don't have the same quality of life as the rest of us, and so we should want to bring everyone up. Right? We want everyone to have electricity, everyone to have 
internet. And with that, in order to move and participate in society, we want everyone also to be able to have access to financial services. We want people to have the freedom to transact. Uh, so I think uh, Eric really nailed it on the head there. And you know, this is why I'm here. Uh, I'm also here because I think cryptocurrency is cool and uh, I like trying to figure out how things work and then telling other folks like you about them. I like that part of it. Um, but primarily, I think that we all should have the freedom to choose how we transact. Uh, and so this is about privacy as well. So that means if I want to be able to transact privately, I should have the freedom to be able to choose to do so. Uh, if I'm OK with you know, using my PayWave, using my credit card, and having those transactions be linked to my identity, then that's also OK and fine. But having someone tell me that I'm not allowed to transact using a certain volume of cash or uh, the paperwork required to do so, these types of things, these restrict our freedoms uh, and these limit our options. Uh, and so definitely, I think the freedom of financial transaction uh, you know, is one of, one of our most important things, which you know, crosses all borders, crosses all subject areas, um, crosses all political parties. So I encourage you to check out uh, Permissionless Keynote uh, for the rest of what Eric has to say. OK, so moving on, maybe I'll turn these lights back on. Back specifically to privacy, a lot of people think that privacy is important. Uh, in fact, there are laws about privacy. That's how important that we feel that privacy is. Uh, New Zealand recently updated its Privacy Act to include some elements of the digital life that we now are used to. So, you know, protection of personal information, ensuring it's collected, stored, used, and disclosed in ways that respect individuals' privacy. So this is about how we treat people's data. It doesn't really matter who you are. You're probably interacting with either uh, participating with either the donation of your data or the use of your data or the collection of somebody else's data if you know, uh, the smallest of small business has to maintain, um, is maintaining some customer data, uh, especially once everything goes online. So the Privacy Act has been updated to reflect this. And so like, that's pretty good um, in ways that respect individuals' privacy. But I've highlighted respect here because we don't really know what respect means. Your version of respecting privacy could be different from my version of respecting privacy, right? And you know, ultimately, it could be different from the law's version of respecting privacy. So personal information, this is pretty standard. Um, but we also have things in here like a picture of your face. So this is you know, digital only representation as personal ID, personal information. Uh, and then it says, sometimes even your opinions on social media. So again, I think it's a good thing. It's being recognized that how we act online can be uh, you know, used for good and for evil. Uh, so opinions on social media, you know, prime examples are that uh, an employ a future employer, ho hopefully not a present one, a future employer you know, does a search of your social media before they decide whether or not you're a good fit for their organization. Um, you know, and of course, they have, they, they have a right to decide that you're not a good fit if they don't like what they see. Um, but you know, this is considered to be personal information. Now, what the New Zealand Privacy Act does not do is they do not tell you what privacy means in terms of an actual definition. So it's left, it, it, it's not that it's left open for interpretation, but it's, they don't want to, they don't want to specifically define it uh, because that may be exclusive and that may leave some things out that are important. Okay, so there's not a definition of privacy. Uh, and the other thing it doesn't do is it, it doesn't imply that it's a right of every citizen. And so the reason is just from that word there, that we are a citizen you are a citizen of the state. If you're not a citizen, you're a temporary visitor uh, assumed to play by the rules of the state. And the state may say that actually there could be a potential threat here, there could be an issue, and therefore, in that case, your privacy 
is, is no longer uh, respected in the same way. Uh, and this, you know, it's, it's not too surprising. <coughs> um, take like your cell phone, for example, right? Everything's private on your phone until it's not, and you're at the airport, and some security person is asking you to unlock your phone, and you're like, what do I do? I got to catch my flight. If I don't, I'm going to miss my flight. I don't, I don't have any, you know, I can't stay at the airport, uh, and so on. And so in that situation, right, like you, you have no choice, really, but to unlock your phone, and at that point, right, you're under, you're playing under different rules. Um, so there are these clauses in here, you know, it's not universal. Zooming out a little bit, the UN also says like, hey, privacy is really important. There's a whole article about privacy. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference, privacy, family, home, correspondence, or attacks upon such. Everyone has the right to protection of the law against this interference. So the UN comes a lot closer here to A, saying everyone has this right, as in it's a human right. They also are saying that there shouldn't be arbitrary interference, but again, subject to what does that mean? Arbitrary, my arbitrary could be different from yours, um, especially if you consider that maybe I have some suspicious uh, transaction activity attached to my name, right? Uh, then some people may deem that it's warranted. And again, protection of the law. So the UN can come out and say this uh, because the UN doesn't have any teeth, right? The UN can't enforce laws here in New Zealand but they can like put up some nice guidelines and say like, look, we think that you know, everyone should be treated equal and we think that you know, if you, if you uh, go to war in an unjust fashion, you, know, you should be uh, subject to criminal trial and, and, and these sorts of things. But again, the UN isn't enforcing laws here in New Zealand. So the EU, a few years back in 2017, 2018, uh, came out with GDPR, which is now kind of filtered or uh, trickled out to all the other nations uh, as a format for being able to adequately control people's data. Um, so Google had a 50 million euro fine for insufficient transparency, control, and consent over the processing of personal data for the purposes of behavioral advertising. So condense this down, right? Google's entire model is advertising. That's two thirds, that's 70% of their whole revenue is advertising. And the advertising model works best if Google knows what I look at on the internet and then serves me up ads to give me what I want, right? That's when the ad model works its best. Um, and that in itself is you know, a whole other kettle to crack open there, this idea of what big tech or what monopolistic tech does with people's data. Uh, but the GDPR said, like, we starting to claw back some of this and starting to fine companies over it. So a more recent example has been levied this year in May, although uh, not surprising, Meta has appealed, and so it's not settled yet, but they've been proposed a fine of 1.2 billion euros. Basically for how they handle the storage of user data. So Facebook is based in Ireland because of the favorable tax laws. So that's why it says here, uh, Meta Platforms Ireland Limited. And uh, Ireland is part of the EU, so they have to play by the GDPR rules. And what Facebook has done is, you know, we talked about distributed systems a lot. Facebook doesn't have everybody's data only in one spot. They have a distributed system, data on different servers, and periodically they move that data around to different servers. And so what the GDPR says is that European citizens, you have to treat their data under this law just in Europe. And that can be tricky when you're a global company uh, to sort of untangle you know, who is in America and who is in the UK uh, or who is in the EU and make sure that you're, uh, you certainly, like it's tricky to play by two rules for two different data sets when you've got like one customer database and you're like, you know, you're like sharding and trying to, you know, keep everything in sync. Uh, anyways, pretty big fine. 
And I just did a quick calculation here. In 2022, Meta made 109 billion euros in revenue. Okay, not profit, that's in revenue. So this fine would be, you know, 1% of their total take for uh, last year, 2022. Now, uh, you know, predicting what's going to happen in the future, they won't end up paying 1.2 billion. The lawyers will get in, the lawyers will get, get their piece, and they'll come to an agreement at something less than that. But it, you know, conceivably could still be very, very big. So financial data now is data too, right? Personal information, Google, Facebook, sort of global companies. But financial data is also in whatever bubble or um, whatever organization structure you have. Financial data is in there too. Uh, and here in New Zealand, we're in the middle of this investigation into the latitude financial breach. Uh, so this wasn't necessarily misuse like Facebook and Google, but it could have been misuse. I mean, we're not really sure exactly, exactly what happened. Um, you know, it could have been misused, say, by neglect or by uh, outdated security measure measures. And so, uh, 1 million New Zealanders and 40,000. So, 1 million New Zealanders had their personal data uh, leaked. And that includes things like driver's licenses, but it also includes if you don't have a driver's license and you want to get a loan from GEM Finance or GEM Financial. Um, one of the ways to do it is to, you know, upload a photo of your passport. And so 40,000 New Zealand passports were in that data breach. And so this is ongoing. That is in May that this investigation is launched into Australia and New Zealand. I think it's about 14 million people in ANZ. So we've talked a bit about cash already, right? It's fungible. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, permissionless, although as Eric reminded us, if you try to take a large sum of money on an airplane, you'll see how permissioned it actually is. Um, and it's pretty much the most private way to transact. And you know, hopefully, cash never goes away entirely, but we have seen the use of cash erode over the past number of years. We've seen the volume of cash transactions erode, uh, and even like, Small businesses and cafes, they might not accept your cash anymore, even though your neighbor probably will. Um, but as of now, you know, cash is still a legal way to transact. Contrast it with banks. So they're good at keeping your data private, um, although we just saw a contradiction with latitude. But you generally don't see this with uh, the larger banks. They sort of maybe have a bit more money to spend on things like cybersecurity but they still do represent a single point of failure. Right? And importantly, they can refuse you service. So we see this all over uh, Australia and New Zealand. If you guys want to start a crypto business, right, and you start uh, offering services to people where you convert their money into crypto or back and forth, it's going to be difficult to find a bank account in Australia and New Zealand. And um, right now, in Australia particularly, a lot of businesses are being just basically cut down. And the bank is pulling the rug saying, no, we're not going to offer you any more financial services. Uh, and they're allowed to do that because that's part of their business model, is to say, if you look risky, we don't have to offer you our service. Uh, similarly, the government can reach in and open up the books and see what is happening in, inside the bank. Um, and you know, perhaps they can uh, seize your assets and freeze your accounts, right? Especially if uh, you're involved in criminal proceedings, right? As soon as you get arrested, they're going to have a look at your financials. Uh, and if they find something that looks suspicious, they're going to freeze it and take it. So in the digital world, in terms of data, we've seen Cambridge Analytica. This was the... Uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica is the yeah, data analytics company that was using Facebook data to uh, serve up election ads and uh, to influence uh, the, basically the election in America. But what they were doing was they were using people's data without their authorization in order to do this. 
sort of all the, these two things happened around the same time, uh, the Snowden leaks. So Snowden unveiled a number of programs that the US government was doing where they were basically collecting all the data and then deciding later what to do with it rather than collecting data in advance, sorry, not in advance, rather than collecting data once somebody got identified uh, as a potential person of interest. Uh, so PRISM and programs like X key score, X key score basically is, uh, it's key like keys on your keyboard. Uh, and it's just collecting all the data uh, that anyone is typing in and then later you know, deciding if it's necessary to keep around and what to do with it. And so Snowden revealed this and it caused some change. But for instance, yesterday I looked into X key score and there's no record of it being shut down. So it's probably still in operation. And you know, the way they get you is, um, so Prism for example, Prism was an agreement with the tech company so that they could go into the tech companies and access user data. So you got a Gmail account, boom, Google uh, is there and they can you know, read your Gmail account. So it was a bunch of tech companies involved in, in Prism. Uh, and then X key score, what they could do is sort of at the, uh, at the, at the fire hose, uh, they can go to the, the infrastructure points and they can uh, collect all the traffic that's happening there. Now it's no good if that traffic's encrypted, that doesn't help, but you know, there's still enough and plenty of traffic that is not encrypted. So in the blockchain world, what can we do about this? So we've got kind of like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and then we've got Monero and privacy coins as being a little bit separate. Uh, and then we've got maybe CBDCs in that list uh, as well, although CBDCs are not necessarily on a blockchain, but they are kind of like born from the idea of a distributed system. So crypto is pseudonymous. There's only weak anonymity there. And we know this because we can go look at block explorers. And you can click around and you can copy and paste and search for addresses, search for transactions. And these transactions might be marked or tainted. And I think we'll try to have a look at this in a second. For the UTXO model in Bitcoin here to make a transaction, the unspent coins also point to an address. So the change from a transaction, and that gets recorded in the ledger so that you can come back and look at it at any time. And then you can infer behavior based on the transaction activity and that may also infer some identity as well. And then there's non-repudiation. If, if you're caught out as identifying with an address, uh, you can't go back and say, oh, that wasn't my address before. Uh, I had nothing to do with that. So Satoshi knew this originally as like a uh, downside to the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, not necessarily a flaw, but more, more of something to be cautious of. So the risk is that if the owner of a key is revealed, then you can go through this process and you can link together the behavior and you can link all the way back in time as well. And if you look closely enough and you follow long enough, you might be able to put together some sort of map identifying actual people, not just addresses. So we could apply this idea to Satoshi himself. Uh, chain analytics folks, they look at the blockchain uh, and then they try to you know, extract some insight based on that data. And Satoshi is a very popular figure, so people have spent a lot of time looking at transactions believed to be Satoshi's. So this was a news story from last year. Fifty Bitcoins, so that's an original Coinbase award, February 2009 are on the move, right? So not too many people were mining in February 2009. The network went live in January 2009. So an early block reward was moved. People are speculating that the coins might belong to Satoshi, which means that Satoshi is active. 
And here's a look at the data analysis that was done. So these are block numbers. So it's very early on, 2,600 to 4,400. And we can see some very clear patterns here. And these patterns are based on the nonce. So the nonce is the number that's used once that you update in the header so that you can rehash the block in order to meet the target. And so these blue lines here, it was thought that these are all coins that belong to Satoshi. And then the green ones showing up here are a different uh, sort of a different fingerprint to what happens. And the analysis concluded that the ones that moved came from this green entity or user here and not from the blue ones. So kind of an interesting way to look at some of the data and make a deduction that we know the early coins moved, but it's probably not what we think to be Satoshi's coins. So over here I said what we could do is we can try to like take our transactions and blend them into the crowd and add some anonymity to the pseudonymous set. Um, and this is the, the premise of mixing. So mixing coin join pools and we'll look at tornado cash. So here's just a short diagram here. I forget exactly where I got this diagram uh, to give it credit. But basically, CoinJoin says, in one transaction here, if Bob is going to give Ted 15 Bitcoin, obviously the transaction was from a while ago, <clears throat> what happens is you have 20 as your input, 20 belong to Bob, and then your output is split between the recipient and the change goes back to Bob. So this is how it works. Rather than the account-based model, where you just peel off the 15 needed to give to Ted, what you do is you create an output that then also gets sent back to Bob. So two transactions separated without CoinJoin. And then CoinJoin says, well, what we're going to do is we're going to bring them together so that the outputs here, so there's one, two, three, four outputs. If you have enough outputs in the set, then you don't know whose output goes to whom. So rather than there being two individual transactions, we have one coin join transaction. Now, if you only have Bob, Alice, Ted, and Carol, uh, then you could probably do some real quick detective work and work out who is who. But if you have a thousand people, or if you have a thousand outputs, not necessarily people, right? then it becomes a lot more difficult. One of the downsides is that you can recognize a coin join transaction. And this, in the time since coin join has been around, has been a little bit of a problem for some people because an exchange might say, hey, I don't want those coins. They've been involved in a coin join transaction. And then they're kind of like inferring that maybe you did something nefarious uh, either to get those coins uh, or, you know, Maybe you're involved in something like that. So these transactions can end up to be a little bit tainted. Uh, and you get the same thing that can happen with pools as well. So tor tornado cash is a pool. So you can literally imagine like a pool, and then afterwards, you don't necessarily know who did what, but you know that those people were all in the pool. So you say like, hey, to use a bad analogy, like I know you're a swimmer, all right, but I don't know if you're the one that like laundered the money. But suddenly now you're in this set involved with everybody else. So Tornado Cash is a ongoing and interesting case here. Nobody's using Tornado Cash anymore, but Tornado Cash was very popular a couple years ago. And Tornado Cash is on Ethereum, and it's smart contracts that work on Ethereum. And what they're, what they're doing is they're providing an anonymity set by pooling transactions together, such that you can deposit a fixed size. So for example, one ETH. Um, then you, at some time later, 
you wait a bit, at some time later, you can withdraw one ETH from the pool. And then when you take the ETH out, that breaks the link from when it went in. Now, if you sort of bounce in and out real quick, then based on the time, you could be able to link the transactions. So that's not a good idea. If you have a very specific amount, like a nine digit number, so like you know 0 0.987654 and so on, if you have a very specific number, again, that could link the inputs and the outputs. So the pool is set up to only take like these whole numbers. So 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100 ETH, and the same thing with DAI. So they're not gonna mess around with swapping any coins because again, that adds another layer of, for the detectives to be able to work out um, who was sending what to where. Uh, so fixed token, fixed token size, and then Again, if there's only one person in the pool, it doesn't matter how long you wait. You know that you went into the privacy pool, you came out of the pool, uh, and you're, you're the same person. So it only works by having a large number of people being in the set of potential people that can withdraw. So when you want to deposit into a pool, uh, you look at the contract list. If you want to swap in one ETH to break the chain, you have to use the one ETH pool. Uh, and that's going to be a specific contract. And when you do it, you're going to generate a note, okay, that's going, you're going to keep the note, it's going to be deposited with your ETH, and then you're going to use that as like a receipt. Does it say receipt on here? Submit request with deposit proof in order to get that back. And this is very similar to in the Lightning Network we saw when people transact. You, the person issuing the invoice also attaches a secret that then can be redeemed on the way out so people can get their fees. So this is very similar to that. So in the pool at any given time, you've got all these one ETH amounts, which are all tagged such that someone can redeem them, but we don't know who, and they're just waiting to be redeemed. So at some time in the future, someone can reach in, give the smart contract the redeeming receipt. The smart contract then will select the appropriate ETH to send out, and at that point, the, the link has been broken. So Tornado Cash was, you know, going swimmingly. Uh, that is until the North Korean hacker group, the Lazarus group, uh, started using Tornado Cash to launder stolen funds. And perhaps they had been doing this for a while, but at the time that the uh, US authorities decided that there was a strong evidence for the link. Uh, what they did was they just basically went through and they banned everything, and they put sanctions on anyone that was going to use Tornado Cash. So from their Twitter, they actually took down the GitHub page. It's since been reinitiated, so you can visit it. But they took down the GitHub, and they looked on GitHub, and they looked at all the people's accounts that had contributed to the project, right? Who, who had made the smart contract? And they started like flagging all of these accounts. Some of them were just anonymous. Some of them could be linked to identities. They looked at all the contracts and they uh, flagged those as well. Uh, RPCs, so that's the remote procedure call uh, that was being processed by Infura and Alchemy. So if you tried to have access through Infura and Alchemy, that got shut down. Uh, that's an ENS domain as well. Now, you can't like shut down the smart contract, right? Because it lives on all the Ethereum nodes all over the world. But you can do this, which, which is enough to dissuade people from using it. So if you're not North Korea, right, and you're not trying to launder money to fund your weapons program, why would you want to use Tornado Cash? This is a, a question that comes up a lot, right? Like it's it's like saying uh, I've got nothing to hide, so you know, go ahead, I'll unlock my phone for you to browse through, right? But it's not about having nothing to hide; it's about being able to have the choice to reveal that information. Uh, and so Vitalik came out and said uh, he used Tornado Cash to donate to a cause where he didn't want to get in trouble if done publicly, right? So maybe you are a high-profile person, have some celebrity and you don't want your ETH address to be seen 
to be donating to a cause. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, and so you could use something like Tornado Cash to break the link, right? Vitalik, uh, and you know, he, he has like a public address. I mean, all addresses are public, but people know Vitalik's main address is, and you can go see, uh, see his ETH, and you can like follow the funds, right? Same thing with like, um, sort of sidebar here, if you're into like investing or trading coins and you want to see what like the, the whales or what the uh, rich people with a lot of resources are doing, right? You can follow their addresses and see how they're trading their crypto. So in a similar fashion. So Vitalik said, I don't want people to know what I'm doing here. Uh, so use Tornado Cash in order to donate. Um, this K in this case, oh, I think it was to the war, the Ukrainian-Russian war. I'm not 100% sure about that. Yeah, I guess not to donate to the war, to create more war, but to donate to uh, charitable causes. Uh, so recently, there has been a bit of debate in crypto Twitter about uh, privacy pools. So Vitalik and these other good folks here listed on this paper, they published this paper. Up down here it says uh, privacy pools, uh, novel smart contract based privacy enhancing protocol. So what they're doing here is they're saying, let's turn this around such that you take the example of Tornado Cash where I mentioned the problem was being tainted. So if you used Tornado Cash uh, for even some innocent purpose like uh, research and development or experimentation, at some point in the future, you could get linked to that. Uh, and that you know, could affect your reputation or maybe it may, it may be worse. So I guess like turning this around, Vitalik said, well, what, what can we do about it? Maybe what we can do is this uh, idea that we can prove that we're part of the tornado cash pool that did not come from the Lazarus group, right? And you think, okay. So now we're taking the pool and we're kind of splitting it into sub pools. You've got like the innocent pool, all the good folks that just want privacy of transaction. Uh, and then you've got the not so innocent folks, which are the folks that stole the money in the first place. And even though they don't want to be associated with it, they are since there's that, that link. Uh, and so, this sort of spawned this meme called proof of innocence. And the idea is that you have to go out of your way to convince people that you're innocent, which is you know, a little bit different or a lot different, a lot backwards rather than someone going out of the way to prove that you're the guilty culprit, that you uh, did participate in that. So you know, uh, trying to ask people to prove their innocence for a transaction, right? Or maybe getting even further away from where we want to be here. Um, separating, trying to separate out the good and the evil activity from within the set or trying to separate out the regular from the tainted activity from within the set. So this, I think this just came out about 10, 10 days ago. Um, Vitalik was on a podcast on the weekend talking about this or that I caught on the weekend. And so it's uh, sort of brand new stuff. How do we deal with this idea? How do we deal with the concept of a chain, you know, an, an unbroken hash link chain, which is the blockchain? How do we deal with the fact that there's going to be some nefarious activity? There's going to be some stolen funds. Uh, and can we have privacy uh, at the same time? OK, I guess now brings us to one of the main techniques where we can add in some anonymity on top of our regular transaction set, and we can help do this. So in this paper, uh, you know, zero knowledge proofs are used in privacy coins. Zero knowledge proofs are used. We've mentioned ZK stuff a little bit. Um, right now, we're going to go through an example, uh, kind of like a metaphor uh, for how ZK proofs work. So what you want to do is prove that you know something without revealing it. Easiest case is to prove that you're old enough to buy beer. 
One way to do this is to show the vendor your driver's license. But showing someone your driver's license also reveals your date of birth, also might reveal your home address, also might reveal that you're an organ donor and that you drive a motorcycle. Uh, okay, so it could reveal a lot of information just to be able to buy some beer. So one way around this is a proof of age card. So let's say you don't have a driver's license, let's say you never intend on driving a, a motor vehicle. You can get a proof of age card and now the proof of age card says, yes, Jeff is 18 years old or older, right? But it doesn't say my date of birth or any other information about me. So that's a way to add privacy. So you reveal that you're old enough, which is the bare minimum that you need to reveal. You know, ideally, you shouldn't even need to reveal your name, right? You should just be able to reveal that you're old enough to meet the legal requirement and you're like, uh, have enough money and you're a person standing there willing to, to buy the beer. So zero knowledge proofs can help with this idea of only revealing what's necessary without accidentally revealing all of this other stuff. Uh, you don't want outside observers to be able to understand what's going on. Uh, sometimes with a zero knowledge proof, you need this trusted setup. So there's some cryptography that has to take place in order to create the transaction, and that might not be easy. Uh, there might be some computational burden. Uh, there might be certain types of things you cannot turn into a zero-knowledge transaction. And so this is like a subset of cryptography intersecting these days with blockchain, which is getting very specialized. All right, I forgot Alibaba's K was in here. So let's do this one first. So we're looking at a floor plan here, okay? P is the prover. The prover is going to prove that they know the password to the door. So this is a cave, right? They're gonna go in, they're gonna go through the door, and they're gonna come out. And the verifier needs to verify that I know the password, but the verifier, I don't wanna give the verifier the password. I just wanna prove, oh yeah, I know how to get through that door, and I'm gonna show you, but I'm not gonna tell you the code. Right, so I don't want to reveal all the information, which would be the password. And the verifier then um, is assured that I do know what I'm, what I'm doing. So what, what, what happens here is I'm going to wait. The verifier is going to randomly select which way to go. And say, hey, why don't you take path B? Okay, so I'm over here at the door. Verifier yells out, I want you to come back through path B, which is down here. In order to do that, I have to go through the door. So I put in the code, door opens, and I go through, and the verifier says, hey, you did know the password. You weren't lying to me. Then the verifier says, ah, but you might have been lucky. Right? Let's, say, let's say it was only like a two-digit code. Right? You, you might have got lucky on your first, first guess. So what you're going to do is you're going to go back and you're gonna do it again, and the verifier is going to say, I want you to go through, and sometimes, if the verifier says A, sometimes you won't have to put in the password and you come back through the right door. Sometimes you will have to put in the password to come through the right door, but if you always come back on the right side, then the verifier has no choice but to like statistically say, all right, this guy has to know the password to the door. So you say that that person knows the password, but they didn't have to give it up, right? They didn't have to give up their date of birth. So that's Alibaba's cave as, uh, as an example of a zero knowledge proof, where the zero part is that you didn't know the password, but you knew that the other person had it. Okay, so I like this one. This one comes with like a visual component so you can look and you can, you can find Wally. Pretend that you haven't found Wally though. What I'm gonna come is I'm gonna come show, I'm gonna come prove to you that I know where Wally is. So what I've done here, uh, we all have the same copy. So I've taken this, I put it behind the screen, and then I say, look, here he is. But because you can't see behind the screen, 
right? You don't know geographically where Wally is. And so if we have like a, an n by n grid, then we have to go up to at least 2n by 2n in a, in a 2 by 2 in order to do this. But I can come over here and say, it's very, very tiny, but would you agree that that's Wally? Uh, yes. Yes. So then I can say, yeah, I know where Wally is. And I can say, all right, would you agree that that's Wally? Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, red and white stripes, right? Okay. So, so there Wally is, but you don't know the physical position in order to determine when you come back to look at this, where he is. You have to start your search all over again. So you think, oh, yeah, Jeff knows where he is. But when I look at it, and you can imagine that this grid is huge, right? Like a kilometer by a kilometer, something enormously big. I can prove to you that I know where he is without revealing his location. So that's another example of a zero knowledge application. So the digital version is like this. So you may have, you may have found Wally. The digital version goes like this. I'll say, did you get that? AKA, did you find him? And I say, well, here's the proof. There he is. And I'll make it nice and big. So here, Wally has a cane. Wally also has like a sister and like an evil twin, and they kind of like wear different things, but they're not exactly like Wally. So that's the proof. But again, you don't know exactly where. All you know is that that shows that he's there. And I come back to this one and I say, okay, so now where is he? So what we're doing here is we're proving the inclusion in a set. So we're proving the inclusion of your transaction that did not come out of North Korea is in the anonymity set right, of the good people. So we're proving your inclusion in the set. But I didn't tell you where it was. I didn't tell you which one it was. All I did was show you that it was there. And of course, by now, you have probably found Wally to be here. So that's the, uh, the, that's the non-cryptographic version of zero-knowledge proofs. And uh, I am not a professional cryptographer, uh, and so I will not try to show you any more than that. But it's, uh, it's sort of a, a niche area. Uh, it's turning out to be very important because of the ideas of privacy. Uh, and it's also as computing power is getting better and more research is going into the cryptography, it's also getting more efficient, this idea of being able to have zero knowledge computation. So to wrap today, just talk about some privacy coins where what is essentially happening is people are putting technologies on top of the standard blockchain structure that we know of. So the big two are Monero and Zcash. So Monero is different from Zcash in the sense that all transactions are private and untraceable, whereas Zcash has the option to have private transactions. So they have a bunch of technology here. And under the board right here, I said we need to conceal the amount, the to and the from, in order to get from pseudo-anonymity to anonymous transactions. So they have something called stealth addresses to hide the receiver. They use some cryptography called ring signatures to hide the sender. Um, by ring, you can just think of like a set. and You don't know which one in the set it was. Digital signatures, we know what those are. Uh, ring CT, confidential transactions, hide the amount that's being, transaction, that's being transacted, and then to really drive it home, we better hide the location as well. So I2P routing, if you're into uh, anonymous browsing or how the Tor works, um, these technologies are used to conceal the location. So these are all separate pieces of tech. Um, so in, you know, in summary, it's, it's not simple. And the other thing is that when you're in a privacy system, like you're in the privacy system. It's, it's not like I can easily go from Bitcoin to Monero and back to Bitcoin to maintain um, privacy through all of those 
transactions. So the other one is Zcash. Uh, the Z is for zero knowledge. And Zcash ha has the option of having a regular transaction or a shielded transaction, which gives you that extra privacy uh, using uh, a ZK snark, uh, which is a zero knowledge um, sort of technology. Shielded transactions have no knowledge of the sender, destination, or amount. So that's what we want. Those are, those are our big three. How much is it? Right, because you can track the number, especially when you've got like 10 or 11 decimal places. Who's it coming from? Who's it going to? Uh, it's open source, which I haven't mentioned about until now, but that's important so that you're assured that there's no backdoors or you're assured that uh, it's doing what it says it is doing. I looked at some stats on the weekend and couldn't find anything more recent than this. Not that they don't exist, I just didn't, it wasn't obviously apparent to me. But not that many transactions on Zcash are using this shielded um, privacy technology only about 6%. And so the problem with that is back to the idea of only one person being in the pool. They're anonymous until you realize that they're the only person that, that's there. And so then it doesn't matter you know, what obfuscating clothing they're wearing. You still know, like, dude, you're the only one in the pool. Uh, so that could be, that could be an issue um, you know, moving forward. And the other thing is there's a high computational burden. So sometimes to like package up these transactions, it could take like 10 or 15 seconds of computation. It could take longer on a mobile device to create the zero knowledge proof um, and to be able to push all that information through so the transactions are also going to be larger in size. I guess sort of uh, another one to just briefly mention here is Mimblewimble. Uh, th this like goes all the way where basically nothing is stored. Transactions don't store amounts or addresses. History can be erased. The developers are anonymous, right? It's almost like it's one of these like uh, one of one of these uh, programs in a spy novel that you know doesn't exist except that it does exist, um, and. I had a look recently. Uh, there's not much activity, but that doesn't mean that the technology isn't viable. And you can go look at this project, Grin, Mimblewimble, uh, as a privacy coin. Uh, one thing they do in there is automatic routing as well to uh, obscure location. So if that's one of the bubbles between anonymity, security, and privacy, uh, we'll do another one looking at security. But again, it's not necessarily the type of security in terms of just keeping stuff risk-free. Uh, it's going to be more looking at vulnerabilities, threats, and attacks to the blockchains that, that we're used to. Uh, and anonymity, we won't have a special session on this, but it has been kind of a theme all the way through that your transactions are pseudo-anonymous, not completely anonymous. 